All right, so we're now into week two, and this week we take up uh, the history of social welfare policy, and you'll see behind me uh, a quick outline of what we intend to cover this week. And so first, we'll uh, talk about these uh, three conundrums, and we'll define what that is uh, in a second here, but essentially, uh, these are arguments put forth by a man named David Elwood, uh, a social policy scholar at Harvard and a former advisor to President Bill Clinton. And essentially, he's arguing that uh, over the course of our uh, poverty policy history and uh, repeated efforts to address poverty throughout the years, uh, there's some there are some recurring themes, he notices, that seem to uh, happen over and over. And so we'll look at what those are. And then in the second part of this lecture, we'll go through uh, the various uh, different sort of historical eras, and so you'll notice that the first, uh, uh, the first uh, era here is uh, the British Poor Laws of 1601. So the U.S. Uh, welfare system borrows largely from the British system, and so it makes sense for us to go all the way back uh, to the British system and uh, how it originated uh, in, in Britain. And so we'll take a look at the Poor Laws, uh, and then we'll look at the early relief system in the U.S., and of course uh, I just noted that the U.S. system borrows from the U.S. Uh, from or borrowed from the British system, and so you'll notice that the early relief efforts here in the U.S. Uh, look very much like uh, the, the British system that we'll look at. And then we'll take uh, just a slight detour, and we'll look at the origins or the history of the social work profession and where the profession comes from, the different roots of the profession. And then uh, we'll come back uh, into a historical discussion, uh, historical discussion of social welfare policies per se, and then look at uh, more the modern era. And by modern, we're talking into the 20th century and uh, into the Great Depression era, the 1920s, and into the 1930s during uh, Pre uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration, uh, or what uh, what's, uh, what historians will call the New Deal era. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that refers to uh, President FDR's philosophy about what the role of the federal government should be. And so he sort of, he announced sort of this new uh, philosophy about what the role of uh, of the federal government should be. And so we'll take a look at that New Deal philosophy uh, and some of the programs uh, that came out of that era. And then finally, in the third part of this lecture, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at uh, an organizing schema. That is, last week we talked about different ways in which we classify all the different policies that are out there. And so uh, among those different classification schemes, we noted the distinction between social insurance programs on the one hand and public assistance programs. And so we'll take a closer look uh, at what those terms uh, exactly mean, public assistance versus social insurance so that'll be the third and last part of this lecture. All right, so first, uh, in the way of these uh, helping conundrums, uh, and so David Elwood uh, is putting an argument together, or multiple arguments, uh, actually, uh, about these recurring themes in our poverty policy uh, history. So government, uh, government efforts over the years to address the issue of poverty uh, seems to give rise uh, to recurring uh, issues that, uh, that just, uh, it's, it's almost like the same issues that happen over and over, and he's noticing uh, three of these themes that happen over and over, and so uh, specifically he's using the language of conundrums. He's, he's noticing these three helping conundrums, and so by a conundrum we're talking about, uh, I've, I've brought in a few uh, dictionary definitions here, American Heritage Dictionary says uh, where you have some problem or some issue and uh, there just doesn't seem to be a solution, right? So pretty straightforward, that's what he means, uh, that's what the dictionary means. Right? That's, what the, that's how the dictionary is defining uh, the notion of a conundrum. And then you have the Webster's Dictionary. Uh, once again, some issue or some problem where you can only really guess as to what the solution might be. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a problem with no satisfactory solution, in short. Uh, and so David Elwood, in his own words, uh, defines a conundrum as, uh, based in part of the language, uh, this is David Elwood's language, but he simply says it's uh, damned if you do or damned if you don't situation. So you're, st you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, is essentially what he's saying, right? And so, uh, in the language of economists, uh, where it's, it might be something akin to a trade-off, right? You're, you're trying to address poverty. Uh, the government is trying to find ways to address poverty, but in doing so, there are some related issues, some sort of uh, side effects, often unintended side effects that seem to pop up, uh, for which we don't always have the answers, is what we're talking about in the way of uh, conundrums. Okay, so the first of those conundrums uh, we're labeling, or David Elwood is labeling as a security work conundrum. Okay, so there's a trade-off between security and work. Uh, and so uh, the basic idea here is that the more effective, uh, the more effective the government is in providing security, so we have greater security that we're trying to ensure, uh, that is trying to meet people's basic needs. These are people who are poor. And so when, uh, ironically, when the government is uh, quite effective 
uh, or more effective in, in providing for people's basic needs, it often takes away the incentive uh, to work hard. And so our, uh, our economic efficiency, the productivity of our, of our country uh, may fall uh, is the basic argument. And there are sort of two uh, different lines of reasoning here. There's uh, sort of a psychological uh, element to this argument. There's, there's also an economic element to this argument. Psychologically speaking, the basic idea, uh, uh, by way of analogy, is to say that if you know that there's someone uh, there or some entity there that's there to pick you up uh, if you fall, so think uh, maybe your parents or your mom or dad, uh, let's say uh, they're, uh, they're there to support you in the case uh, in, uh, if, you, uh, if you're not uh, doing well uh, financially and such. If you know that there's that safety net in place, then psychologically there's certainly less pressure uh, to make sure that uh, you get things done uh, properly. Yeah, that's, so that's the, the psychological element to this. And then there's also an economic uh, element. And that's the basic notion that uh, uh, whether you're working 40 hours, or let's say you're working 20 hours, if, uh, if you're working 40 hours with no government assistance, and you're working 20 hours uh, with government supports to get you uh, to an income level that's, uh, that's comparable to the person who's working 40 hours in, Certainly, the natural incentive is to work less uh, because you're going to make the same uh, uh, either way, right? So there's an economic element that, uh, that uh, government assistance provides a disincentive to work is the argument. And so you can see how there might be a trade-off between how effective government is in boosting people's security or basic needs. And then, of course, uh, then we're saying that work, uh, on the other hand, uh, the work effort will go down, right? Uh, the second conundrum here, uh, the second problem that's posed that uh, we have difficulty finding a solution to is that of changing family structure. So over the years, uh, the percentage of births to unmarried moms has just skyrocketed, especially since the 1960s, when uh, back in the 60s, uh, I would say, uh, not I would say, but uh, if you look at uh, the studies, it's 5% uh, of all births were to unmarried moms back in 1960. Uh, and then by 2000, uh, 2006 uh, into 2010, into the most recent uh, decade, uh, that rate is close to 40%. 40% of all births that happen in the U.S. are to unmarried moms today, uh, as opposed to 5% back in the 1960s. And so there's, uh, there are a lot of uh, social science explanations for why that might be happening. And one of the major ones here is uh, put forth by conservatives who claim that uh, it's too much government involvement. Now, we looked at uh, libertarianism and such. Uh, last week, but uh, it's a notion that there's too much government involvement uh, that uh, our poverty policies have actually contributed uh, to the increase in the portion of births to unmarried moms. That's a basic argument, and that uh, the more government steps in to provide assistance uh, to needy families, then we're changing the nature, uh, the fabric of the family uh, to, uh, to a, more, a greater proportion of uh, single parents is, is what the basic argument is saying. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the conundrum. Of course, uh, there, there's certainly there's arguments back and forth, but uh, if that's the case, then one might think that uh, states with higher benefit levels, right, if we're incentivizing the formation of single parent families, if, then it should be that uh, states with higher benefit levels should have higher rates of uh, proportion of births to unmarried moms, but that's not necessarily the case. And so there's, there's certainly arguments back and forth, uh, but uh, of course there are plausible arguments from the other side, from the libertarian side also, that uh, the structure, the structure of government programs, namely uh, back in the 60s, we had what were called the man in the house rules. That is, if it was uh, a caseworker would go out in the middle of the night uh, to welfare recipients, and if it was found that you had a man in the house, then uh, your welfare benefits were cut off. So you can see what the incentive might be in the way of uh, family formation. Uh, finally, here you have a targeting isolation conundrum. Uh, once again, you have uh, you have governments uh, trying to address this issue of poverty, and so uh, we're starting with uh, limited resources often. Right, we, uh, the government often has limited resources to go around, and so uh, the, the idea is that we want to channel those resources, those most in need, but uh, the side effect, uh, whether intended or not, uh, is the fact that you're differentiating between those who receive those benefits, uh, that cash assistance, and those who don't, and in doing so, the natural corollary is that uh, you, you're, you're basically isolating the poor or the recipients, uh, you're distinguishing and you're st uh, stigmatizing. It's basically a stigma argument, it's the idea that we're stigmatizing the poor uh, even though we, the government may be well-intentioned in providing assistance. Uh, and so, once again, we have a trade-off. The more effectively, the irony is that the more effectively we target our resources, our government resources, then uh, uh, the more effectively we target 
then you end up isolating or stigmatizing uh, the poor. All right, so that's the first part of this lecture. And the next, in the second part of this lecture, we'll uh, pick up uh, with the different historical uh, eras that uh, we'll be covering uh, in this class.